Hello. In this video, we're considering the poem I Being Born a Woman and Distressed by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Before we start, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, it would be fantastic if you would. It'd be greatly appreciated and all you have to do is press the button below. Many thanks. I have the poem here, so let's start. I, being born a woman and distressed by all the needs and notions of my kind, am urged by your propinquity to find your person fair and feel a certain zest to bear your body's weight upon my breast. So subtly is the fume of life designed to clarify the pulse and cloud the mind and leave me once again undone, possessed. Think not for this, however, the poor treason of my stout blood against my staggering brain. I shall remember you with love or season my scorn with pity. Let me make it plain. I find this frenzy insufficient reason for conversation when we meet again. This is a splendid poem with plenty to unpack, so let's get started. In this sonnet, the speaker states, just because she has sexual feelings for and engages in sex with an attractive lover is insufficient reason to build a long lasting relationship or even speak when they meet again. At least this is the surface reading, yet the poem is open to other interpretations. Written in the first person voice makes the poem profoundly personal and intimate. Addressing her lover in the second person, your, creates intimacy iambic pentameter and the use of enjambment run-on lines makes the poem conversational. For example, think not for this, however, the poor treason of my stout blood. It is reasonable to suppose that the speaker and the poet are one. Although Edna St. Vincent Millay had male and female lovers, Framing the poem as a discussion about how society stereotypes women as weak and emotional suggests here the lover being addressed is a man. In the first line, the poet creates an ironic tone that continues throughout the poem. Millay subverts the traditional iambic pentameter by placing the stress on I and the B in being to make a forceful statement that she is a strong woman while outwardly professing to be a woman distressed. Here, distressed means suffering from extreme anxiety, sorrow or pain. A stereotype, but also a pun, from furniture or clothing, which has simulated marks of age and wear which therefore makes the speaker seem like an object being objectified and the object of the man's desire and wish to possess, own her. This theme runs through the poem. This subversion is fitting as Millay also subverts the traditional view of women, my kind, as weak and seeking validation and an identity only through a relationship with another. The speaker admits her biology distresses her, creates needs and notions and is urged to feel a zest, energy, to have sex with her lover. She feels compelled to bear your body's weight upon my breast which euphemistically and delicately refers to the act of lovemaking, basically sex. It may also reference Cleopatra's speech in Shakespeare's play Antony and Cleopatra, O oh, happy horse to bear the weight of Antony, 
referencing an epic love, but foreshadowing that like Antony and Cleopatra, their love will end tragically. In line six, the speaker refers to her sexual drives. So subtly is the fume of life designed to clarify the pulse and cloud the mind and leave me once again undone possessed. She states she lacks the agency to resist him and must submit to these sexual desires because these urges are driven by nature. The fume of life designed suggests she is driven by nature and by the human race's need for procreation as much as by recreation. Fume suggests the heat and energy and the sparks each generate when together. Clarify, sharpen the pulse, suggests he sets her pulse racing and her heart beating rapidly. Cloud the mind implies her urges replace her reason and sense. And leave me once again undone, possessed, suggests this has happened to her before and will continue to. Undone and possessed suggests that through sex, the male asserts his control over the female. Possessed implies that men often see a woman as an object to be owned. Possessed is also a pun, suggesting she is being driven wild by their affair and he is constantly in her thoughts. Enough so to write this sonnet. The speaker later describes her frenzy. However, she warns her lover that just because she's abandoning all reason and giving way to her urges is not a sign of love. Think not for this, however, the poor treason of my stout blood against my staggering brain, I shall remember you with love. Poor treason suggests her body is rebelling against her better reason. Stout, strong blood implies a rush of blood is rebelling against her staggering brain. Staggering is a pun, meaning brilliant brain, and also fallen, defeated, brought low by her passion and sexual needs. On line 11, remember, implies this is a temporary liaison and her lover will be forgotten, abandoned, and she will scorn them and feel no pity. Let me make it plain. I find this frenzy insufficient reason for conversation when we meet again. The speaker is candid and unapologetic. Let me make it plain. She describes these moments together as a frenzy, reintroducing the theme that their relationship is driven by passion. The emotive word frenzy and hyperbole hints that her lover drives her wild with passion. Perhaps this wild abandonment of her senses troubles the speaker. And the poem is a reaction to a fear of becoming absorbed by her passion for him. The poem is ambiguous and the poet's motivations for writing it is open to many interpretations. On the surface, the speaker is warning her lover that she is strong and will abandon him once her needs have been satisfied. Yet sonnets are usually associated with love, while this one seemingly is focused on love and abandonment. However, like many fine poems, this sonnet is ambiguous, as demonstrated in its ending. For conversation when we meet again, suggests she will not speak with him when they meet again. Yet, the line could be interpreted that she doesn't want him for conversation, but sex. When we meet again implies they definitely will see each other once more, perhaps continue their sexual liaison. 
The sophisticated vocabulary she uses implies her lover is intelligent like her. For example, on line three, knowing he will understand propinquity, meaning closeness or proximity. Also, for someone who states she will not love him, will scorn him and show no pity, she goes to the trouble of writing this remarkable, witty and elegant sonnet. Perhaps revealing that she harbours strong feelings for him that go beyond sexual urges. The tone is playful, revealing a close bond between the speaker and her lover. The sonnet adds gravitas and formality, hinting that this relationship may be driven by something more substantial than lust, and the writer may hold strong feelings for him. We are left to question the poet's sincerity and concede this poem is likely written tongue-in-cheek, with the poet at her most ironic. It is reasonable to suppose her lover will appreciate the compliment Malay is paying him. I hope you found this video interesting and helpful. If so, please hit the like button. Please also check out our other videos on writing and textual analysis. Also, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. Until next time, from Carol and me, write well.